to welcome you to another edition of Being Well Informed. This is our podcast that we air and share with the audience about current events and current uh, issues of importance to the community. My name is Claudia Barber. I am your podcast host, and we have a wonderful program in line for you today. We have as our very special guest, Mr. Willie Hamilton. Hello there. Uh, good evening. How are you doing? How are What's you? Going? I'm doing wonderful. Good, good, good. Good. We're glad to have you here. And um, our focus today has to do with uh, actually an article that you uh, wrote in the Baltimore Sun on what's wrong with the parole system, uh, yes. proposed changes to the parole system. Uh, tell us uh, who you are and uh, a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Willie Hamilton. Uh, I'm a returning citizen. Uh, I was incarcerated at the age of 16. I served 30 years, 110 days. Uh, I became a prison advocate while in uh incarcerated uh, when uh, I myself saw the injustice of the justice system and the need for change. Uh, once upon, uh, upon my release, I continued with my prison advocacy uh, and also working with reentry and the need to change for uh, the parole pro uh, process. And uh, you know, I've been home since June of 2022. And this is my pursuit. Marvelous. Marvelous. Mm -hmm. This is the third program, uh, and it won't be the last program we've done uh, on the issue of returning citizens. Yes. Uh, but your particular um, op-ed or editorial caught my attention because yes. you have shared in the editorial uh, why the whole parole system might be broken. So why is the process for granting parole broken? Well, I don't want to say might be, it is broken. <laughs> so uh, the reason, uh, you said the process for granted parole. So yes, I can deal with it from the standpoint of those who are serving a life sentence. Uh, these type of procedures are broken uh, because one, they require uh, that first that you serve a, a certain amount of time. It was uh, 15, 12 years. Uh, with good 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 time credit and then then you have your first hearing and after that first hearing which is really a formality they will give you some type of rehear maybe five or ten years and tell you exactly what kind of things that they're looking for at your next hearing uh but the parole procedure itself there's no standard meaning that you can come in with all of these programs all of these certificates, the family support, community support, and everything, and still yet the parole commissioners will have the uh, uh, can't just deny you with no no reason. And uh, for me, when you talk about rehabilitation uh, and the, the parole process, the parole process should be for those guys who are sentenced to a number of years, who mm -hmm. and who have shown and demonstrated. Uh, the the act of uh, being rehabilitated, early release. So when you've mm -hmm. demonstrated these things, then that should actually take place. But but with lifers for nearly twenty years, this is not the case. You have people who were had college degrees, very minimal infractions, and and so on and so forth. But they were still denied parole, mainly because the parole commissioners could do it. Hmm. So when you say minor infractions, uh, what do you mean by that? Are we talking about, let's say, for example, possession of marijuana or cannabis no. or something like that? No, you could have missed your door. You could have been out of bounds. You could have been in an area where you were not supposed to be. But these are minor infractions. And it could have been an infraction that you didn't have for if a person was locked up for 30 years, he didn't have an infraction in 20 years. But uh mm. yet and still these type of infractions will be brought up 
when you've demonstrated in 20 years, I've never caught, I haven't caught an infraction, or 10 years I haven't caught an infraction, and they will be the symbols of usage for denial when the real mm. reason is, you know, th there's no structure. Okay. So how can lawmakers make the system both fairer and better when protecting the public? Well, uh, again, we talk about rehabilitation. Uh, lawmakers must understand, and the only true way of understanding is really going into the prison and seeing what needs to be fixed, and also dealing with those returning citizens, and the and the uh, the citizens population there to find out. Okay, how can we make this better? Uh, because they're they're outside in, and they they can't really fix the problem. It is only us, those who went who endured these ordeals who can help fix it. Uh, but one of the things when you deal with parole, that there has to be a standard. There has to be something, okay, uh, if you achieve this, 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 then you've demonstrated to us that you have been re rehabilitated because the act of incarceration, meaning you're, you're punished, your sentence is your punishment. Then after your punishment has to come a form the form of rehabilitation and this is what incarceration is you're sent there to be rehabilitated so if you've demonstrated that you've changed your uh whole outlook on life meaning if education uh mental health treatment anger management substance abuse treatment you've demonstrated you you've accomplished all of these things uh then what should be afforded to you is the act of being released and this is, I mean, and it's cost effective on our society. And you've demonstrated that you are no longer a threat to your society because, you know, one of the uh, eliminating factors of crime is education, is knowledge. So if a person has come to prison, mm -hmm. he's, been, he's been educated, then his uh, recidivism rate has dramatically dropped. His act of, uh, if he's uh, dealt, dealt with mental health issues, and he's been in mental health treatment, then his recidivism rate or his uh, act of going out there to commit crime has dramatically uh, decreased. So then the job has been done. Okay. So the Justice mm -hmm. Policy Institute describes Maryland's parole process as fraught with challenges. Yes. Why? Well, uh, there are a number of things. Uh, for nearly 20 years before uh, the government was taken out of the process, uh, the parole system was used as political tool, uh, meaning that uh, whoever came in to be the governor, they used this act uh, as a way of showing that they were tough on crime. Uh, point being Glenn Denny in 1993. Before that time, uh, the returning citizens were uh, out on work release. Who had life sentences? They were out on work release. They were coming in and going out every day, jobs, raising families, and everything. Uh, one incident occurred, and that then Governor Glenn Denning decided to take it upon himself to use it as a political tool because he was losing in a race. And he said that life means life, and no matter, uh, uh, no one will be released if they had a life sentence unless they were very old or very sick. Uh, and he made this his platform for winning. The governor's race. Uh, so for nearly two, while this was not legislation, meaning that it wasn't a law, but this was a policy that he created. And for over 20 years, each governor that came into office adopted the same policy when it really wasn't even legislation that did it. You know, uh, so this is the flaw in it. So uh, like myself, I went up for parole five times. Mm -hmm. uh, I could have been it could have been six. So how how does the system fail to okay? Go ahead. How does the system fail to adhere to its own regulations? Because the regulations state that if a person has demonstrated that he is no longer what you said earlier a threat to society and that he's been rehabilitated, then parole should be the final recourse. But yet, there should never be a time where a person can go up for parole who has did maybe 20, or 30, or even 40 years, and the parole commission to see that he's accomplished all these things. And the only 
advice they can have for him is that uh, remain infraction free. That there's no more things that we can uh, suggest for you or offer you. So if there's no more things that I can offer you or suggest for you, then the only recourse is that this person should be free. So this is this is the flaw in the system that there's no mandates that that the state okay if you've done A B C D then you've demonstrated that you have been rehabilitated and by demonstrating such your reward is to be granted parole. This is what lead. This mm -hmm. is what what's needed. Why did Maryland have a sharp decline in hearings for early parole during the COVID-19 pandemic? A decline in hearings? Well, uh, there, there are a number of factors. One, uh, how the parole uh, hearings were conducted, they were, they were in person. So, uh, and the Maryland system was not... Uh, able to adapt to virtual hearings until later on. Uh, and then a lot of times, even the system itself, that people did not have faith in the parole system, so they would not go. Me, me myself, in case my first hearing, I never went to my first hearing. I denied it because it, it, it felt like that there was no use of going when you knew what the ultimate decision was going to be, that they were going to tell you no because of the policy that the governor has uh, put forth. When you first appeared for a hearing on getting early parole due to COVID, why was it denied? <laughs> During the COVID era, uh, the, the, the reason that uh, it was denied was based upon the risk assessment that was that was, during that time was very flawed. It was based on static issues, meaning that issues that would never change, and that was the nature of the crime. And it was based on the things that I did at, at, as a 15-year-old, meaning my drug history and my criminal record as a 15-year-old, was the reason that I was in my parole. They said that mm. I was a high likely to reoffend again because of my charges and what I did, that my drug history as a 15-year-old. When the 30 or the 28 years at that time of my incarceration, I had no no uh, drug history, no infractions for drugs, no positive tests for drugs, no court any type of drug contraband or any of these things. There was no type of drug scenario in my in my uh, uh, in, in my base file. But the, again, the psychologist said because of my history as a 15 year old that. I would be high, highly like to reoffend again. When they did the risk assessment, then what made it outdated? Again, uh, how they judge uh, if a person was rehabilitated, uh, rehabilitated or not. Uh, how they mm -hmm. judged uh, if you can safely be reacclimated back in society. And, and it was it wasn't it wasn't based on any real dynamic factors, meaning factors that showed your level of maturity over the over the years, because of your achievements, what you've done, your schooling, education, uh, mental health, and all the uh, vocational trades that you may have taken. It was solely based on your static factors, the nature of the crime, and what you do, what you did at that time. So now you're you're out and how does that how has your life changed since you are a returning citizen well uh i'm very grateful uh to be given this opportunity uh at a at a at a, a new life or a life uh, because i was 16 at the time of my consolation mm. uh, and going in as a 16 year old and coming out as a 47-year-old, 47 47 uh, the world is different. And there's a lot of obstacles. But for, fortunately, uh, I had a lot of support from family, friends, and reentry programs that are, that are out here today. The one I work for now, No Struggle, No Success, I was released under their custody. And they helped me uh, 
get reacclimated with society, learning the technology, how to set a bank account up, how to use a credit card. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was so many things, so many challenges that a lot of us are facing that 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 are did long terms of incarceration. You know, when probably you were first incarcerated, that maybe the internet was not as uh, no. as uh, largely out there. No, no. No. So that's a huge, huge difference. Yes. yes. Catching up on those uh, types of of skills, introducing yourself to Facebook or or other um, Twitter or other types of social media, social media. Yes. you know, mm -hmm. platforms is, is mm -hmm. very different. And, you know, a lot of things are online. You apply for jobs online. You um, look up research online and... Uh, then there's uh, oftentimes the internet access to immediate answers to questions. Yes, yes. And uh, research. Yes. So that's been a different tool, I would imagine. Yes. It, it, uh, learning how to use, use YouTube and Google to find the answers to so many things is extraordinary. Uh, you know, and, and it's challenging as well because, like, the act of really learning how to use a computer or a laptop. Oh, mm -hmm. even the phones themselves, right? Uh, I'm a community. I'm a community worker with no struggle with success. So I help those guys who are being reacclimated now, who's done, who've done the time that I've done, and just seeing how they navigate the computers and the phones is like it's a new challenge for us. How did you get a full time job? Well, uh, like like I told you before, I was a prison advocate in prison, so I. Uh, when I came home, uh, my advocacy for the changing of policies in prison uh, was still there. So I was I was going to court for uh, individuals I knew had JRE hearings, like myself, juvenile restorative act hearings, uh, who had modification hearings, and I was speaking on their behalf. I was talking on something that's what I talk about is called uh, survival coping skills, and these are skills that. Uh, young young guys and children used to navigate this uh the criminal system the criminal justice system these prisons that were not designed for us so i talked to judges about them i talked to attorneys and them about it and then i started working for a prison advocacy organization who were who was one of the ones that helped me get home and while in being in a transitional home and work uh, being in a re-entry organization uh, uh no struggle no success uh I asked them to give me a job, let me help out, and they, they saw my potential and they hired me. So it wasn't it wasn't difficult. Wonderful, that's wonderful. Yes. Yes. How? You. What other changes are needed? Being specific as possible, uh, that uh, can uh, get us on the right track uh, to making concrete changes to the parole system. Well, uh, my suggestion, which I talked about uh, to the parole commissioner uh, two days ago, is that right? Reentry needs to start from the beginning. Uh, these tools mm -hmm. that we're giving now needs to start when a person is, is in prison, and even now, like uh, with parole, what they do with those who are serving life sentences when they're given parole, they're given a a six month or a year delayed release. So they see some light at the tunnel, into the tunnel, but they're still being, uh, they've been granted parole, but they'll tell them, okay, you've granted parole, but you got to wait six months or a year before we let you go. Uh, and they say that this is because they want to send them to a minimum, a medium, a minimum security prison where they can do work release and job training and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. this doesn't happen. So my suggestion to them was instead of giving them a six month or a year delay release that they be sent to a re-entry program where they're gonna get housing, they'll be supervised, they're gonna get job training, they're gonna work with computer labs, they're gonna learn how to get their vital records, I mean, their birth certificate, social security card, they're gonna learn how to do resumes, they're gonna do mock uh, job interviews. This and, and, the, and, the, and most re-entry programs last for six months to 18 months. So mm -hmm. instead of giving them this delayed release and having them warehoused and sitting, not 
uh, really getting the, 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 the type of system that they need, that they can send them to these reentry programs and they'll be afforded all the benefits that they deserve, desire. Beautiful, beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, the, the other, uh, there was a Judicial Reform Act that passed in back in 2016. Then mm -hmm. there were, have been more um, legislation passed that even allows uh, ex-offenders to cast a vote for elected yes. officials. Has yes. that been a difficult process or were you aware that you can now vote? Well, uh, I was still incarcerated at the time of this pass. So it was rocky for those guys who were incarcerated, even myself, because I was part of the MA council. So we were called up there at 12 o'clock in the morning, given these forms and say, inform the population that they can vote. I've never voted before in my life. So I didn't know how I can explain to mm. these individuals that you're eligible to vote. All I could do, all I had, I hit some papers right here. They said y'all can vote. I don't know anything after that because I never voted. But upon my release, uh, I became an election, I mean, a voting technician. I worked at a voting polls and I voted for the first time when I came home. Because okay. I understood the critical nature of Beautiful. voting. It was through legislation that one, that the JRA, the Juvenile Restorative Act was passed, and also the, the bill that got the governor out of the pro parole process. So I was the first in PG County to be released under the JRA of the Juvenile Restorative Act, and also the first in the state of Maryland to be okay. paroled after the gov governor was taken out of the process. So I, I saw the, the, uh, the power of mm -hmm. really the poll. Right. Right. Now that again was a legislative act and it's yes. by the people that you elect and put in the chair and the house of delegates and in the state Senate and that yes. happening. Uh, so yes. it, it, you know, voting matters. It really yes. matters. Yes. So what closing comments do you have uh, for our listeners who are interested in learning how they can uh, be effective change makers or change agents in uh, understanding the parole process and also effectuating change. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I, I often say when I talk to people is that don't let any returning citizen be defined by their worst mistake. Uh, mm -hmm. Especially when, uh, if you are a person who believes in redemption, uh, if you're a person who believes in rehabilitation, uh, if you're a person who believes that, uh, and I don't like using second chances. I always say, if you believe in giving a person a chance, uh, because it was only because of someone giving me a chance that I was able to do what I'm able to do today. And there's hundreds of us, you know, and a lot of us are not uh, seeking attention. Uh, we're not seeking media, fame, or fortune that we just see the, the need for the work. So don't let the worst mistake of my life uh, mm -hmm dictate to you how you should treat me for the rest of my life. Uh, try to see the positive and the good in people. And if you're a believer in, in these things, then, you know, you have a voice. I love that. I really, 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 you know, love that. I appreciate you so much, Willie Hamilton, for being a part of our podcast this uh, wonderful day. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you for having me.